now, right now. Right. All right, so, Vijay. Right, right now, thank you very much. Welcome everyone, Generwards. Thank you so much for coming wow. here to Eat of Air Dance and Amorphic and Budget Work. My name is Luis Alvarez. I'm the program coordinator here at Cineworks. And on behalf of myself, our executive director, Dan Small, our equipment and facilities manager, Colin Willis-Croft, we want to welcome you here to the workshop. But before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that Cineworks stands on <clears throat> unceded, traditional, ancestral, and current homelands of the Coast Salish people, which include the Musqueam, Squamish, and Village of First Nations. And as such, in the work that we do here at Cineworks, we seek to inspire and support the independent filmmakers of Vancouver, especially those from underrepresented people. And such as these, workshops such as these, uh, help to inspire, to encourage, support the emerging but also established filmmakers. And our space also strives to be safe, positive, and inclusive for all that come. Welcome, welcome, and also welcome to all the people who are watching us right now. And without further ado, yay! Thank you very much. Exciting times. Uh, this is the second time we're doing this workshop. The first one we had lots of challenges. Um, it basically ran too long. So if it seems like I'm rambling, please stop me. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, this is uh, the Anamorphic on a Budget uh, workshop. And what do we see there? Blake, do you want to pull in some slides for me, please? All right. So this is actually, as of this morning, the Anamorphic Cookbook Express version. Uh, the Anamorphic Cookbook is a series that I'm putting on the channel that covers from the origins of the format, why it matters, why do we care, why are we passionate about it, how the lenses work, and all of like the small details. But it's also like four or five hours long, and it's not even halfway done. So we're going to cover a lot of it here uh, with the opportunity for interaction and questions and a live demonstration with a variety of lenses. Hopefully, you'll get out of here with some more understanding and clarity on where do you want to go with this kind of knowledge. Um, this is me. I'm also right here. Um, I'm Chit Fahadengs. I run this YouTube channel for seven years now, yes. Uh, seven years, I teach at Langara, and I still struggle as a public speaker. So uh, <laughs> if you want to find more stuff besides what we cover today, you can go on the channel, youtube.com slash anamorphic on a budget, and there's hundreds of videos there. Um, this is the outline of the cookbook. I just forgot to delete this slide. So, um, introductions. Uh, I already know your names, and since we didn't have like a disclosure contract, you were not going to show up in camera unless you want to, and I'm not going to say who you are unless I'm calling you out for doing something. Uh, but what brought you to this workshop? I am very curious. You can. I was going to point to someone, but you can voluntarily go. All right. All right, so with the goal of enlightenment to DP an upcoming short film. All right, that's good enough reason. Little music video. Really well. Afterwards, I think. Look. Better. So great. You know, like, more cinematic. <sighs> happy with it. But, and also, I've been making films. It's something to get really excited about, you know? Um, like, bizarre. Yeah, I mean, good to get excited. <laughs> okay, yeah. This is why I started. I was like, ah, oh, everything kind of looks the same. Yeah. And then I went down the rabbit hole, and like 10 years later, here I am. Uh, I still don't know what the gear I like, but we're, we're going. We're going. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I love how you said both anamorphic look and cinematic together, because there's a slide coming exactly about that with those two things side by side. Uh, okay, anybody else volunteering? 
is going to be ripped from my chest. I'm going to try to, uh, core, like, con what is the word? Consolidate? It's not consolidate, but kind of repeat what everyone is saying. Okay. Um, yeah, OK. Anybody else wants to volunteer while they're here? So the left side of the room is the engaged side, and the right side is the observant side. Normally, I would sit over here, so that's fine. Um, OK, so what brought you to this workshop? Um, did you ever use anamorphic lenses before? So I already know the answer is no for this side. No, another no, another no, another no. Five no's, OK. Um, I guess that's it. We can move on. Um, is there an important anamorphic film in your life? Just as an example, uh, you might not know if the film that you care about is anamorphic or not. So um, let's just talk about important films in your life. Like, I'm assuming all of you are into film. OK, correct assumption. Good, good, good. Um, are you into film to make money, or are you into film because you enjoy it? You're like, you watched a film one day, and you're like, this is what I want for my life. Both. Both. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Um, let's talk about inspiring films, then. Uh, the money-making part is very important, yes. And the industry is not good for that, so we've got to change it. Uh, but there's lots of good films out there. So what's an inspiring film you've seen, either from your past or recently? OK. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Anything, maybe, yeah. OK, what else? What else? Tron? <laughs> I liked it because it's Oh, yeah. All right. OK, so we have also one vote for Tron uh, with emerging technology. And this is kind of like it kind of overlaps with what we're doing, because this was an emerging technology at one point, and it changed the film industry some 60 years ago. Um, and that was kind of the point. It was like super fast, and lots of people got into it really quickly. So which one and why? The anamorphic look. I said it was coming. I did say it was coming. Um, what is the anamorphic look? Wide. Good. It's a good one. Interesting bouquet. Yes. Um, some oval shapes, some lens flares. Yes. Star Trek much? <laughs> JJ Amron's full on. Um, yeah, the, the aesthetic of anamorphic lenses on the anamorphic look has been strongly associated with sci-fi and epic stories and like immersive situations where you have like a really wide field of view and like tiny characters and all of those kinds of things. Uh, and like we have films like Blade Runner, Star Wars, Indiana Jones, just like if you put Harrison Ford in it, probably gonna be anamorphic. <laughs> and then you have Ben Hur, Apocalypse Now, Chinatown. A classic one that a lot of people say is Lawrence of Arabia. Lawrence of Arabia was not anamorphic. Somehow it's like up there and it's like widescreen, all of the things, but it was not filmed anamorphic. It was just delivered in anamorphic. So, and um, the anamorphic book, uh, anamorphic look is all about being more cinematic. And what does that even mean? <laughs> Like, what is more cinematic? And it doesn't have to relate to anamorphic. It's just, what are we pushing towards? Cinematic is like a... <laughs> a feeling? OK. <laughs> Difficult to describe. OK. Um, oftentimes, it's like high dynamic. Mm-hmm. Um, the, in, like, the narrow depth of field. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
it's great because those are all things that are evolving. Like when like the 5D came out and you could film full frame F1.4, that was all that was allowed. Everybody's like the shallowest depth of field. Let's have focus here, but not here and not here either. Um, and then we've grown past it to a point where we can think about depth of field and how shallow we want to make it or how deep we want to make it. Um, but I think cinematic is like a catch-all term where you get all of the things that you like from films and you just try to bring them into your own projects. Uh, but with like the hype of social media and YouTube, YouTube does this too much. Like I was scrolling through YouTube the other day and I was like, these are the most cinematic settings. And I'm like, what does that mean? Like cinematic settings, what? Is it like, is it about the frame rate? Is it about the, the, the bit rate? Is it the codec? What are these settings that you're talking about? Um, so yeah, cinematic is, is like a catch-all word that in itself doesn't mean anything, and you can attribute a bunch of meanings to it. So I always find it more useful to try as hard as we can to be clear about what we're trying to achieve. So yeah, the anamorphic look is a thing, and it does make things more cinematic, but we're going to break it down further. And I think it's right now. No, it's not yet, but we're getting there. The most important thing about anamorphics is why do you want to film with anamorphics? Um, and there's mainly two reasons. One, you want to inspire in your audience the same feeling of those classic films that we were talking about. Like, oh yeah, I want, I'm, I'm doing a sci-fi story and it's a horror and it takes place in a spaceship. So I'm going to film an anamorphic because I want people to like be unconsciously reminded of Alien. It's like, it's a classic. Everybody knows it. It's very scary. Um, I want people to be connected with that, but not necessarily be thinking about it. So that's one option. And the other option is I want to use these lenses because other directors or cinematographers have used this in the past. And if I'm using the same equipment as them, or sort of similar enough, um, this puts me closer to what they were able to create. So there's two very different motivations there. One is you're trying to manipulate your audience, whether they know it or not. And the other one is you're doing it for yourself. Um, a lot of the stuff that we do for the channel uh, is mostly because I want to film it in that way. I was like, does this story need to be anamorphic? No, but I want to. So that's it. <laughs> and since you don't have to deal with budgets and whatnot, um, we can just do it. Um, so these are the two options. And they both connect to a sense of nostalgia. Like you're either referring to films from a long time past, or you're using equipment that was used by filmmakers in a long time past. So you're trying to keep something old alive. And I think that the most important thing that we have to remember at this point is the culture of film and I guess our society at that time was not very encouraging of a lot of minorities, like the representation of women and black people, brown people. Uh, it was not good back when anamorphics began. So if you're trying to reference those times, it's very important to choose what it is that you're taking from that time and bringing into the present, because you don't want to, I don't want, I don't know if you want, I hope you don't, <laughs> don't want to perpetuate the, this kind of like, bad stereotypes uh, or just bad representation in general. Um, so if we're, if we're moving for the future with a hint of the past, let's only get the good stuff. Um, and yeah, about these two, there's no right answer. It's just what works for you. If it's like, I want to use these lenses because I am passionate about it, or this story really calls for it. Um, when you go into the making money kind of thing, uh, 
a lot of the times it's going to be the story that calls for it. Like, oh, this story is fit for this aspect ratio, and the best way that we're going to achieve it is by using anamorphic lenses. Um, but not always. What is this? OK, so now this is where we're going to break down the, the anamorphic look. And this is Dan Sasaki is the optical vice president, no, the vice president of optical engineering at Panavision. And we're going to talk a little bit about Panavision in the near future. Um, but he breaks down the anamorphic look in five pillars. And they are bokeh, which we already mentioned, disproportionate breathing. He also likes to use very complex words, so disproportionate breathing. Street flares, J.J. Abrams, organic focus roll off. And if there is one weak aspect in this list, this is the weakest one for me. You're going to see why. And magnification and perspective. Uh, I'm just going to check if there's people sending us questions. No, no questions from our online audience. Uh, let's go into this. Bokeh. This is La La Land. And if you look at Bokeh, um, you can see there's like tiny ovals in there. They're not circles. Um, but the question is, how does Ryan Gosling still look just as good as he does in real life, but the out-of-focus areas are squished? Like, how is a part of the image squished, but a part, another part of the image not squished? Like, why are the out-of-focus areas squished? Exciting enough? That is a very complex explanation that we're not going to go into. Uh, it just happens, and it relies on one key principle that we're going to cover later. Uh, but bokeh, the oval bokeh is a key aspect of the anamorphic look. And a lot of people call it the waterfall bokeh because it's like somebody with a paintbrush went there and just like um, to kind of smear it and make it more painterly-like. Um, so bokeh is number one, and here's Leela, my sister. And we have an anamorphic lens. The, the bokeh is right on the corner there. There's a highlight. And you can see like things are stretched out. They're thinner than a circle. But then when we add a comparison to a spherical lens, and it's about the same field of view. So we have a 40 millimeters anamorphic on one side and a 20 millimeters spherical on the other side. You can see the bokeh is vastly different. Um, that is part of the look. Like, her face looks about the same. It's just more of what happens in the background and with the out of focus areas. That is very unique and can almost exclusively, lots of asterisks, be achieved this way. <laughs> uh, so that's bokeh. And then disproportionate breathing. There's a fade here that I messed up. So. Um, Disproportionate breathing means that, let's go back one slide. <laughs> um, where am I going? Here, we're going here. So what happens here is, in an anamorphic lens, you have two, before we go into that, any questions so far? Any concerns? Are you already tripping and you're like, I cannot follow what's happening? that's valid. I get that a lot. Because <laughs> I just go. But OK. Uh, so what happens here is, this is a 40 millimeter lens. Everybody familiar with focal lengths? Yes. OK. So this is a 40 millimeter lens. And as so, it has a particular field of view, both horizontal and vertical. And the anamorphic lens or the anamorphic block in it, which would be like this. This is an anamorphic block. If you look over here, you see that I'm squeezed. Um, or more even, better even, this is a circle here. This is a circle here. But if you look from here, this is an oval. I'm going to pass this around. And you can pass it on to people. Uh, the front shouldn't fall off, but uh, we're going to get to it. Um, the idea is you have an element in front of this 40 millimeter lens that is squeezing more field of view onto your image. So you have 40 mil horizontal field of view, and usually half of that as a horizontal field of view. So this is a 40 vertical and a 20 horizontal. So when we match it to a 21 close enough, 
what happened is we cropped the top and the bottom of the image for the spherical lens, while on the anamorphic, we used the entire sensor. So we're just making better use of our data rates as well. Data rates? Yes, data rates. OK, so this brings us to we have two different fields of view, or like two different focal lengths, one for horizontally and one for vertically. And this leads to disproportionate breathing. So right now, we're focused on these water droplets in the foreground here uh, in front of this house. And then when we rack focus to the background, you see that the house kind of squishes in. Um, and that is disproportionate breathing. It means that the lenses breathe in the vertical axis, but not necessarily in the horizontal axis. Uh, with a lot of the lenses that we're going to see today or that are being released these days, you see breathing in both axes, but the vertical one is still much more pronounced. Um, all right, we're back. And so this is another aspect of it. And you can only tell this if there is a rack focus. If no one rack focuses ever, you can't tell there is disproportionate breathing. Number three, lens flares, streak flares more specifically. Big lines from a light source. Very, very widely popular in this film. I think there's 600 of them in the 2009 Star Trek. I was watching a video today to make this slideshow, and it was just a fast forward of the film with a counter for every lens flare. I stopped at 500 something, and it was not the end. Um, and the streak flares just happen because of how the light reacts to this element. So this is not the idea of a spherical lens, is every element, every glass element in that lens is made of like the radius of a sphere. So if you cut a sphere in multiple different sizes, you can make a lens. Uh, but for anamorphic lenses, they're not. They're cylinders. So they only have a curve in one direction. And even like if you looked at this thing, you will see that it's like this way, but it's not curved the other way. So we'll, we'll pass this around again in a little bit. Um, and it's that element that creates lens flares, that combined with the coatings. So another lens flare. Um, the classic lens flare is the blue one, is from Panavision's like, C series. Someone online will correct me if I say this wrong. Uh, it's just how it is. Uh, and the color of the flares comes from the coating of the anamorphic elements. So there's a lot of blue flares in the past. And then recently, when we started to see much cheaper anamorphics come to the market, like Suray or Vazen or Great Joy or SLR Magic, all of those like cheaper budget options went hardcore on the blue flares. And they just put such coatings that it was so much saturation. It was just like, this is really, really blue. It's like, the sky is blue, but this lens flare is like 100% blue. Uh, so that's one of the main criticisms that they get is like, dial this down, bruh, or change the color. Uh, so lens flares are a big thing. And then the organic focus roll off, which I think is a little bit of a cop out, but I can still see it. Um, and Dan Sasaki's argument is, if you pay attention of how the image goes from the sharp areas of like her face onto the background, you're going to have a, a smoother transition as opposed to a spherical lens. Like, imagine you worked with a Zeiss or like a Rokinon, any of these lenses. And you look at it and you're like, hmm, this is a little too sharp. And then you put like a Pro Mist or a Glimmer Glass or anything that will diffuse things a little bit more. Um, it, Dan Sasaki's argument is like anamorphics do that by nature. Uh, that's not so true these days, especially with like the cheaper lenses. Some of the lenses we have here are really, really, really sharp, like almost too sharp. Um, but in this frame, if you look in the back, like the back of her hair, it's kind of sharp here. This is spherical. Uh, you can see the bouquet is a circle here. And then when we go to anamorphic, bouquet changes dramatically. But then the back of her head is like a little softer. And 
the reason I think this is a cop-out is this is a 20 mil with X amount of depth of field, and this is a 40 mil, which has arguably half of the depth of field. So yes, it's going to be going out of focus faster um, if you're matching the field of view. But it's there, and it's something. <laughs> all good so far? All good, all good, all good. Blake, do we have any pressing questions? No? OK, um, we're going to get to that. Okay. So I'm going to address it when we get to it. Um, and then five, magnification and perspective. This is also um, dependent on the two different focal lengths that you have. Um, this is a 21, and this is what we see. Um, the important thing is to pay attention to the perspective lines and see how like exaggerated they are, especially when you're into a close-up and you have perspective lines on spherical. We know how this looks. It's a little like it always comes to mind wrecking for a dream. You're like, oh yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Like the big face in front of the camera and everything is kind of warped. Um, and in anamorphic, you can get the, the face on the same size, but the lines are much smoother. Like, look at how less angled the lines on those pillars are, or even the lines on the wall here. Uh, this is a little bit of a cheat. We move the camera a little bit just to make things clear, but it is part of their personality. So these are the five pillars of anamorphic, of the anamorphic look. Spokane, disproportionate breathing, streak flares. What is number four? Nope. Organic focus roll off, <laughs> and magnification and perspective. Um, and then we're going to go a little bit into history. So if you have any questions up to this point, uh, it's a great time. Otherwise, we're going to go in time. So does anamorphic get closer background compared to your lenses? Yes, you could say so. You could say that anamorphic lenses will create more compression uh, and at the same time separate the subject from your background because you're using a longer focal length to have the same field of view. Making sense? Yeah. So where you'd be using a 20 mil um, and get a lot of distortion and perspective and like things in the back seeming really, really far, you can use a 40 mil, get the same field of view horizontally, but have things not look as further away. OK. OK. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. OK, so the question is if coatings were popularized blue because they were blue and popular in the past or for any other reason. And I think the answer is exactly that. It's like you're like anamorphic lens flare on Google. It's going to be like a wall of blue flares. And then some exceptions, like this one, which we were passing around, uh, I think it's warm. I think it's golden or white. Um, but I'm going to pass more things around. Hold on. Even if it's out of context, just for the sake of this, yeah. Uh, where can you see the, like, I know what I'm looking for so I can identify it, but there's no, no easy way. Oh, yeah. OK. So if you get a light reflected on either of these things, you're going to see that this one is warmer and this one is bluer. Um, I'm going to pass this on this side this time, and you can compare those things. Uh, this will also touch on the question that we got on the live stream, because that is a variable diopter or a VD, and the other one is an adapter. Um, but yeah, we're going to go into history. This is Blake's favorite part. Last time he was like, dude, you talk too much about the history. So uh, this time I only have four slides, and uh, we're going to skip a bunch. Um, the origin of the name. Uh, the name anamorphosis comes from 
the Greek, and that's Socrates. Uh, we decided that he was the most prominent Greek, so we went with that. <laughs> um, Anna means again, morph means shape. So when you put those things together, it's kind of like to reshape, and that's what you're doing with the image. You're distorting the image in a single axis. You're like compressing things this way. Now we're going to see why. But uh, so you're reshaping it. That's what the lenses are doing. Um, it all begins in 1914. It's World War I. There's a soldier in the trenches. There's tanks. And there's this old guy uh, in France. And his name is Henri Chrétien. And he's like, our tanks are pretty great, but um, I think we could be a lot better at, you know, this battlefield thing if our soldiers could see more. Because if you look at the tank, like, look at the size of that porthole. And the person has to look all over and be like, oh, yeah, I got to go left, got to go right. There's enemies over there. Uh, I'm hitting my microphone because it's falling from my chest. I apologize. I think it's going to hang on now. But soldiers are in the tank. They only have, like, this much room to see. And there's... French scientist is like, you know what? Let's make this better. So he made like a big slab of glass. It's a cylinder. And he puts it on this porthole. And what that does is it creates a wider field of view delivered to the same size of window. So now the French soldiers and the French tanks are like, wow, we can see everything. We're definitely going to win this war, which they did. Uh, but then the war is over and these tanks are just chilling. They're like, okay, we got no use for this. Um, this uh, Chrétien, was, his profession was inventor, scientist. So he would just make up stuff. And he did a lot of developments for astronomy. And he was like, maybe I should take this, these interesting lenses somewhere. And you know, time goes by. Uh, we're in the 1920s. Uh, he goes to America, makes a little presentation about his lens. Nobody cares. Uh, some other American dude, much more likely, uh, comes in and presents this tiny lens like this big. And it's called the Cine Panor. And what it does is it squeezes 50% more field of view onto your film. And he's like, this is going to be revolutionary. This is going to be amazing. This is going to change everything. And it's going to be the best thing in the entire universe. Um, but it was 1920s. It was kind of like mid to late 1920s. Um, he was competing with sound. Uh, what happened in the 1920s that we know? Very end, very end of 1920s. Is that an answer? That is the jazz singer. You are correct. Um, and what happened in the, in the late 1920s is the Great Depression. So Hollywood's like, should I bet on this thing that maybe works, it's kind of cool? Or should I bet on this other thing that's going to generate millions and millions of dollars? Mm, can't decide. So they went with sound. Uh, sound took forward uh, throughout the 30s, and it made film going a very popular activity again. Um, so what else? Yeah, so testing wasn't a big thing. Film was like, ah, no, this is not a big deal. Let's go into sound. People need to get some sound while they're watching movies. You know, paying all these musicians is costing a lot. No more orchestra. Uh, let's just make the actors talk. Um, and then more time passes, roughly 20, 20 something years. Uh, and then we're in the 1950s, and television is becoming wildly popular. So people are just like, you know, just Netflix back in the 50s and they're square, square tiny TVs that cost an arm and a leg. I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to go to the movie theater anymore. I'm just going to stay here and watch television forever. So the executives are like, ah, man, what are we going to do here? We've got to get those millions of dollars back. We can't, we can't let these tiny televisions take over. They, like, what's the point? And then in 1952, we have this thing, which is, this is Cinerama. Um, and they basically made a giant screen. Uh, this is the contraption, and it's three cameras pointed sort of at the same subject 
and it would burn through three rolls of film at the same time, and it had to be synchronized. Uh, but it created a giant, like, 100-foot screen. My microphone's falling again. Apologies for the sound effects. I hope this is upside down. Nope. Fuck. How did you do that, Mike? Okay, we're back. Yes, I'll take another piece of tape. I'm gonna get all taped up. And then we're gonna get out of this microphone. Okay, well, exciting. So yes, three cameras. They're like, let's make a hundred foot screen. Let's just show like roller coasters and exotic countries and all the cool stuff that the world has to show on this giant screen. They're like, all of your peripheral vision is filled. And then they had the biggest box office of that year. And it was just a promo. It was not like a film. Oh my God, the story is so interesting. It was like, this is promotional material for our system. It's like Apple made uh, an iPhone commercial and it played in the theaters. And people went to the theaters to see that commercial. And then when the film started, they walked out. Um, uh, roughly at the same time, a French dude came back, Chrétien, went to 20th Century Fox and he was like, yo, you know what they're doing? Three cameras? It's a bad idea. I can give you this one little lens. Um, something just occurred. Um, this one little lens, and it's going to solve all of your problems. And their executives were like, uh, what do you mean? And it's like, just, just trust me. So this is how CinemaScope was born. Uh, same guy. Same guy that made the French tanks. And so this is the Cinerama setup. You have Three projector booths, giant screen, thousands of people in the audience. Costs a lot because three rolls of film, you gotta make that sync. The seam is kind of trash. It is kind of trash. If you look up on YouTube, you can see the seams. They have the stuff on YouTube. And then Kaitian solution is one projector with one anamorphic lens in front. And in the center, you can see that the, the, there's a standard screen size. So that's what it was, and he basically, like, doubled. This looks like tripled, but yes. He made it much, much bigger. Again, thousands of people in the audience, but a third of the cost. Um, so the people at 20th Century Fox were like, yes, we will buy this, and we will make lots and lots of this. And let me see if I'm skipping ahead of anything very important. Um, yeah. So on one hand, you had Cinerama, which was a huge success, but costed a lot and required that every fu future film made in that format uh, use this new camera. You had to deal with a lot of limitations. But you also had the option of just like you put this lens in front of everything that you already have and you're done. What's not to like? No need to like renovate the entire industry. You just hire one more assistant camera because you're going to have to focus on both lenses. You hire one security guard because this lens is priceless and there's only two in existence. And then you go. Uh, and that's how they did the robe, which is called advertised as the first film made in CinemaScope. Um, a company named Bosch and Lumb was in charge of making all of these lenses, but they were kind of slow. So while they were trying, a lot of other companies started making their own ways of like compressing the image and delivering that to cameras and movie theaters at the same time. Because the idea is, if you're taking in the picture, what? yeah, so if the light's going this way, it's getting squeezed. And like, cool, giving me more field of view onto the same size of film. But then when you're projecting light from this side, you can project that same squeezed piece of film and the lens in front of it is going to make it go wider. So you didn't have to like have a computer or just like have intermediate prints. You could just use the same print uh, without any kind of adjustment, just going out the same lens. Uh, and that was a big win. Problem is they needed to make lenses for all the theaters and they couldn't make them fast enough. So uh, this one guy named Robert Gottschalk was part of Bosch and Lomb, and he was like, you know, I think I can make this better. And he left and started a small company, you know, kind of unknown this day and age, Panavision. And he was like, I'm going to make these lenses and I'm going to make them better. Um, 
some of the issues that they were facing that we will be able to see today uh, is uh, wow a two-part demonstration here we go um, this is a spherical lens so this is a normal lens and the way most spherical lenses focus as I am rotating this focus ring you can see that the thing is just going back and forth right Yes, yes, not if, yes. Okay, just going back and forth. So a spherical lens basically focus by moving everything a little back and forth. But this thing, if you try to do this back and forth, it doesn't do anything. It does not work. Uh, this anamorphic block focuses by adjusting the distance between the rear and the front glass. So by pulling this out, I am focusing closer. And this also doesn't make an image by itself. So I need this in front of this. And this is starting to get more complicated. Um, this is fine this way, but this needs to be separated. And the further apart you put these, these elements, you're changing how much the image is compressed. So here, if we're at infinity, well, let's say this is doing squeezing two times. You're getting twice your field of view. But then when you go to like minimum focus, which is five feet or a meter and a half, you're getting 1.7 times the compression. Um, what is the problem that shows up from that? What is something that we can anticipate uh, that has to do with the looks of things in film? especially the people in front of it. Yeah. If you're filming everything with this variable D squeeze, but you're projecting everything D squeezed by the maximum amount, if I'm in a close-up, I'm only 1.8 times thinner. But by the time I'm, I'm being projected, I'm being projected two times wider, which makes my face round and actors were not too big on it they're just like nah i'm gonna put a clause in my contract that if you're using these lenses i'm not in it and that was a big deal that was a big big problem uh, because the production companies wanted to like the studios wanted to make big budget epic stories and the actors wanted those stories but they're like nah if i'm gonna look ugly on screen i don't want that so i'm not gonna do it and then Gottschalk, the guy who founded, fun, founded Panavision, is like, oh, I know how to solve that. And so he did. He devised this method, which is very convoluted, in the 1960s, I'm pretty sure, maybe late 60s. He created this thing and he was like, yes, this is perfect. Patent. So nobody else could do it. Um, and that's how Panavision got like, the biggest hold on anamorphic lenses for the film industry until very, very, very recent times. There's a few off here and there, but it's mostly Panavision. And if you talk to people in the film industry, they're like, what's your favorite anamorphic lens? They'd be like, what? There's like Panavision and what else? Um, so Panavision has a very, very big hold on what's the standard and no compromises in terms of quality. Um, during that race in the 1950s, you've had like, this is the race for widescreen. You had Cinerama, Cinemascope, Vista Vision, Super Scope, Todd AO, Technirama, Ultra Vision, Super Panavision 70. Um, you had all of those things as ways to make your film have a wider aspect ratio. Funny enough, like Cinemascope was dead within 10 years. But it's the only name, pretty much, that we still use. We use VistaVision as an alternative name for full frame, but everything else is kind of gone in terms of name, even though this was, CinemaScope was the first one to actually die. Uh, just a curious thing. Uh, let me see if I'm skipping anything. Any questions, concerns, burning desires? Um, 
Anamorphic for vertical content. OK. Um, I think we're going to get to that also when we get to the demo, because we can rotate the lenses and, oh, fuck, that's going to be a whole mess. Uh, but we're going to get to it. Yeah, we'll do it. Um, and we're going to tell why. So let's see if I can insert this here. <sighs> I knew I was forgetting something. Film. Let's say film is like roughly this size. Um, it's a little bit more horizontal than it is vertical. And if you want to get a wider field of view, you compress the image onto that piece of film. The issue is today we're not limited by the size of film anymore. Like if you're filming 8K, 12K, 6K, whatever K amount you are filming, you really don't need that compression. You're not doing it because, oh, I want to use the most sensor area. Like in theory, yes. In practice, meh, doesn't matter. Um, so what a lot of people are doing now is, since the sensor is wider than it is tall, if you flip that on the side, you have a vertical thing. Great, beautiful, yay. Um, but let's say I want to get more. Like it's, it's a little, it's tall, yes, but it's still narrow. So you're back to the origin of the problem, which is I don't have enough field of view that way. So you have your camera sideways, and then you put an anamorphic lens in front. So the narrow aspect of the sensor gets more field of view, like compressed onto it. Is that making sense? No, maybe, possibly, yes. Um, and what happens is it seems like you're using a much bigger sensor. Like if you're using a full frame camera this way, when you expand that, it, you start to get into medium format territory because the sensor is going to be like virtually 36 millimeters tall by 48 millimeters wide. And that is just way too big. I haven't gotten into it. It's too much to think about. Um, but it's one thing. Yes. So the bouquet will be horizontal? Yes, it will. Bokeh will go this way instead of this way. Um, the squeeze is always going to be determining the direction of the OK. Um, so yeah, so uh, what happens after this? Yeah, variety of things. OK. Um, what are we for time? Oh, OK, we're, going, we're doing good time. Um, after that became wildly popular, we had all of those films. We had Ben-Hur, we had fake Lawrence of Arabia, Chinatown. Blade Runner, Alien, all of those things. And then in the 80s, we start to see a hardcore drop in films made in, with anamorphic lenses. Any idea why? Price. What? Price. Price. No. Okay. It has to do with your work. But nobody yeah. knows what she does. Visual effects. <laughs> yes. It has to do with visual effects. Uh, in the 80s, we have, um, late 80s? You have like James Cameron is bringing in the water into what's the name of that movie? No, the other one, the one before, The Abyss. The Abyss. Yes, thank you. Uh, the Abyss, and they're they're trying like experimenting with CGI and seeing what that looks like. And it turns out computers really hate everything that's not perfect. Um, <laughs> and anamorphics are far from perfect. Like they have a lot of gunk on the image. And that's what we like. We're like, oh, yes, this looks awful. That's what I want. Uh, it's a little more than that. Um, you have a lot of personality. You have character. But computers are like, nah, don't. Don't do that to me. Uh, so the solution was going back to spherical lenses because they were better corrected. Like you would have, with anamorphic lenses, you will see that the distortion that you have towards the edges is much more pronounced than the distortion that you have in the center. And that goes towards the other edge. And then good luck mapping that in telling a computer. Like, now you can. Sure, excellent. But it's been 20 years, 40 years. Oh my god. Uh, um, so CGI was becoming a big thing. And then they're like, OK, well, um, we kind of still want that aspect ratio of 2.39, 2.35. But we don't want to use these lenses. So what they would do is either crop the top and bottom, just like waste film, or 
they would use one of these things. And this is just, we didn't have this last time, and I did not put it in the slideshow. So. This has a mount. It's a PL mount on one side. It's a PL mount on the other side. And this is a rear anamorphic adapter. So this goes on the back of your cinema lens. Um, it was very popular, again, in the 80s with long zooms, like 12 to 150, um, 25 to 200. Five. Long zooms, very, very popular. Um, and this one is much more abstract. Like, it will see. Uh, the rear element protrudes a bunch, like it really goes into the camera. And it does that to be cheaper. Like they can control more of the image the closer you put glass to the sensor. Uh, it creates obstacles like that will not go on any of the PL lenses that we have here today. I don't know if Cineworks has any PL lenses that that will mount on. Probably not. Yep. Um, so this is just a piece of demonstration. There's no actual use for it today. <laughs> um, and what that does is it creates the compression, yay, but it doesn't create any of the artifacts. It doesn't give you a vo bokeh. It doesn't give you lens flares. It doesn't give you the disproportionate breathing. It doesn't give you the different magnification and perspective. None of that stuff. It just squeezes the image, and that's it. So they could use that. But then what was the point of family anamorphic anyway? If you're not getting any of the character, then why? So those things were never very popular, and they are still not popular today. <laughs> uh, but they exist. And like, so that was kind of like the death of anamorphics in film until the early 2000s, when a lot of, um, I'd say younger, I guess they're not young today, but in the early 2000s, they were starting their careers, um, and like J.J. Abrams was not starting his career, but he was going into making a, a sci-fi story that had lots of overlap with Star Wars and with Star Trek. He was like, yeah, this look is what I want, and I'm going to overdo the lens flares because that's what I want. Um, and computers could deal with it. So it took them like 20-something years, but computers got good at dealing with the distortions and the character and all the imperfections of anamorphic lenses. So we started to see a resurgence in the early 2000s of both anamorphic lenses and film, as well as the indie market universe realm, uh, where I'm at. <laughs> um, I got into anamorphics in 2012, and that was already kind of late to get stuff cheap, because there was only old stuff. Uh, no one was making anamorphics. The last anamorphic lenses that were made, um, how does this go here? No, not like that. I don't know. Oh, here we go. <laughs> um, the last recurrence occurrence of anamorphic lenses for consumer market was when we were switching from DV cameras, which were like four by three, onto HDTV, where, where we switched to like 16 by 9 televisions. And then you would have your fancy, expensive 4 by 3 camera, and like, ah, I got to make content for these 16 by 9 screens. So Sony and Panasonic made some anamorphic adapters to give you that horizontal, like that aspect ratio. They were terrible. They were trash. They were good for what they were. But 10 years later, like in the early 2010s, they were not good anymore. And what happened was you could find this stuff for cheap. Like, this was maybe $100. And you would put this in front of your camera and be like, OK, cool, this works. I just have to work around some limitations. Uh, limitations being, number one, you have two systems that focus differently. So you have to focus them separate. You'd be like, OK, I will just focus here. And I will just focus here. And bam, this shot's in focus. Excellent, beautiful. OK, now the actor's going to walk from that door all the way over here. 
Mm, let's make this a profile shot so they don't move in depth. Um, this is a pain. Like, this is what's called double focus, and I think somebody was asking about it uh, in our live chat. And this is how it was when I started playing with this, because you would only have these old, old lenses, and you would combine them with whatever lenses you had at hand. So I've filmed stuff with Cineworks's spherical lenses and putting adapters in front of them. Uh, we have an adapter among the list of things we're going to try out, and we're going to see how inconvenient it is. It's very annoying um, for many reasons that I will not disclose right now. Uh, so that was the early 2010s, and then early in like the last three years since 2019, I think, we started seeing much more affordable solutions. Um, anamorphic lens for a film is like $30,000. And then in 2019, Atlas came in and they started offering anamorphic lenses at $10,000. Like, all right, this is so much cheaper. But then I'm like, I only have like 500 bucks. What can I do? Um, so in 2020, I think, 2019, late 2019, uh, a bunch of Chinese manufacturers got into the market, uh, like Surrey, uh, more recently, Great Joy, and they started making lenses that you can get for under $1,000. And they have various limitations. They are like less squeezy than the traditional two times, or they have super saturated lens flares. Uh, we're going to see all of those things. So the idea is now, you have options to choose from. It's always been a game of what's the compromise that you're willing to accept. It's still that, um, but it's you have more options now, and you, it, they don't cost an arm and a leg. Um, so focusing mechanism, we're going to see all of these, I think, except the last one. So we're going to see double focus, kind of. Uh, we're going to see synchronized focus. And I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk about these when we get there. Uh, let me just see what's ahead. Okay, conclusions. So uh, this is the part where we tear this down and kind of like move on to the camera and start playing with things. Um, I'm just going to move this there. I guess I didn't touch on all of the things I prepared here, but well, such is life. Uh, yeah, let's switch. Okay, I'm just going to wrap this up. <laughs> OK, uh, you guys can join me up here. I might, I'm going to turn this on. We're going to turn all lights on. Is this dying already? Not yet. 84%, which means this is dead. Uh, OK. And what we're going to do is we're going to play with a wide variety of lenses. Uh, the last time we did this, not everybody was super engaged into trying shit up. So. Uh, we're going to go with like a sort of more guided approach. Like, look at this, look at that. But if you want to test something or if you want to look at something specifically, uh, this will be the time. I feel my microphone's falling off again, so I might go silent for a second just to adjust it. Eh. OK, so we have this. Blake, are you getting this? Oh, no, not yet. But you should now. Eh. Like, do you have NPF batteries at hand? Or a V-lock that I can steal? All right. Is it one of mine? Yeah. Excellent. Even better. Are you using that little V-lock thingy? Uh, sort of. OK. OK, I got him. Uh, little. Uh, uh, it does. It's full. Uh, what we need to is. Probably tape, yes. Always the solution. Because then I can turn on this, and then we're going to have this camera over there. Yay, my microphone is really falling now. OK. Oh, thank you. I'm going to give you this. Thank you. Um, and then I should have put a light here, huh? Maybe I'll move that 250 over here. Yeah, let's just do this. Apologies to live stream people. Uh, hear me hitting the microphone over and over and over. Um, okay, so that's our effect thing. This is going to go on. Boom. This can stay here, but I'm going to move this bounce. And yeah. 
fun times. Lila, did you succeed? Okay, let's see. Okay, I'm gonna rip off the mic. Ah! Hello, I have Hi. a mic. I'm so gonna regret this choice. Okay, Blake, do we have Pichua? <laughs> Hmm? Okay, we got a picture. Hey, we got a picture. All right. Uh, I might, Ellie, do you want to volunteer? Can I volunteer you to sit on that chair? All right. And then I'm going to move this in and block everybody's vision that is not moving because you should be moving. Do you want to hold the bounce and I'll move the stand? I think we were here. Very intense. Is this falling? Sort of, but not really. But sort of. Okay, we got him. I think we got him. Okay, so um, what we have here, uh, like, let me know if you can put this on the screen. Wow, I almost dropped it. Why is this not charging? Oh, it is charging. My bad. Okay, so we have Ellie up there, and I just big. Like, I put a big wash on the projector. I guess this light will die. Will this change anything? Mm -hmm. Absolutely nothing. Okay. Um, this is just going to go on the gear there. What are we washing with? Oh, that. Okay, so this is the idea. Um, this is a 50 mil anamorphic lens. This is a full frame camera. And we're not looking at it full frame. So this would be our field of view. Um, what do we see that we're kind of disappointed at this moment? OK, yes. Uh, yes. Um, out of focus areas don't look very anamorphic. Um, especially like the, the little twinkly lights in the background don't look a lot. This light uh, on the back there is also hitting the lens. And we're not getting flare, if any. Like it's not no flare. The tiniest amount on the top there, but it's like, would J.J. Abrams be happy about this? <laughs> Definitely not. Um, <laughs> yes. So what can we do here? And well, one of the problems we have is this is a T2.9 lens, so it's kind of slow. Uh, we don't love it. Ellie, can I move you like three feet forward? Yeah. All right. So if we move, we're going to move you further forward. More, 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 Yeah. Okay. So if we put it here. Now the background lights are a little more. No, they're not. They're just, they're just a little, a little squeezier, not too much. You know? They're just like, yeah. This one is definitely not. If I pull it away, it starts to do the thing. Uh, not sure why. Can't answer all the questions. Um, but one thing that happens with this lens uh, is that the closer we focus, the less squeezy it gets. So I'm going to just rack focus from mins to infinity, and we're going to see the image expand sideways. Do you see? Especially if you look at the pillars in the back, they really grow outwards. And it's not what we want. Uh, we don't love it. So this is called synchro focus, because what's happening is the mechanics in here are moving the spherical block back and forth as needed, but also one of the elements in the anamorphic block further away from the other. Making sense? OK. Uh, so let's go for something different. Anyone point to anything? And then we're going to talk about it. That one. Which one? The one he was going to say. OK. Well, I'm choosing this one. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> yes. So would you just say that's just a badly designed don't like the effect of it? It's not badly designed, but I think it, it has severe compromises. Um, 
it costs like twelve hundred dollars or like fourteen hundred dollars, which is unimaginable for an anamorphic lens three years ago. So you can't just ditch it based on the things that you're seeing. Uh, it has good minimum focus, which anamorphics are not famous for. And some people are just like, I want anamorphic, but I don't want flares. I'm like, why? But okay. Uh, so that's that. Uh, if you don't want flares, you can get that. Okay, so now we move to a 40 millimeter lens. And how do we like this so far? Okay, Ellie, you can come in closer even. Let's see how close you can get. You can, you can come very close. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to move you off to that side. And where is focus? Focus is like here. Okay. I'm going to push back to where you are. Here you can really see the image. Like, wow. Yeah, when we get to close focus, it's really, really intense. Okay, so we have some more interesting flares right there. Uh, I'm going to raise this because we're kind of pointing up all of the time. Uh, full frame. So we're going wildly on full frame. Um, oh, yes, we will. Lil, I'm going to move this battery up to the handle. Yeah? Okay. Oh, it's two. Two. Three. <laughs> Oh my god, I'm kind of ruining it. But I like that batteries don't fall. That's the good type of battery right there. Okay, so this is number one. This is number two. This is number three. Good enough. Okay, so now we can go up. And up we go. Let's level there, I think. Okay, this is much better with Ellie being leveled. All right, and let's get some oranges in here. Um, maybe we can run them to this, this thing. Let's trip them here. Okay, so now we do get some more oval shape. Uh, we do get some flares. Um, what else? What else? What else do we see here? How are these two lenses different? Okay, if we just just looking at the outside. <laughs> yes, excellent. One is bigger. Um, it's also heavier. It's a spoiler, but yes. No, this is heavier. And it does not do the thing where it changes the squeeze factor. Like it, if you focus close, if you focus to minimum focus, you're still not going to get like the person's face expanding. Um, and that has to do with how it is focusing. Uh, so what the thing is doing is you have your spherical lens or your, your spherical, your regular lens. And then you have an anamorphic in front of it. And then they design it in such a way where this is focused to infinity. And you're like, cool, how's that useful? And then you throw some more glass on top of it, which is this. Um, and what this is, this thing, is a variable strength diopter, which is a very convoluted name for a thing. Um, you know what a diopter is? Diopters? Like glasses? Um, diopters are both a thing and a unit of measurement, which is great for understanding. Uh, but diopters are lenses that limit infinity. So if you have a plus one diopter, that means infinity is now at one meter. So you can only get to one meter. And they have filters, like they're close-up filters. Um, those are diopters. And OK, so we know what solid dio like unit diopters are, but what the hell is a variable diopter? Uh, and what this does is it has a positive diopter, which limits your infinity. Like, OK, this is going to be one meter in front of the camera. Um, but it also has a negative diopter. OK, that, that is way more confusing. Yeah. I don't know how to explain it. But it's focusing behind the image plane. What this does is negative cancels positive. 
So if this variable diopter is at infinity, it means it's not doing anything. The negative is canceling the positive. And if you put this in front of lenses that are focused to infinity, you get infinity. But then as soon as you start to put them apart, um, what happens is the positive diopter wins. So you start bringing your maximum focus closer from infinity. Yes? No? Yeah. Kind of confusing. Yeah. Um, so you're bringing your maximum focus from infinity up to whatever this thing says. This says three foot six. So up to three foot six away. And it's a similar system that what this lens is using here. When I'm rotating the focus ring, it is adjusting one of these variable diopter systems, and it's determining where infinity is. Uh, this one comes down to, what is this? Is this meters? Two meters? No, this is not two meters. Yeah, maybe it is. Two feet. I think it's two feet. Yeah. It comes down to two feet, which is very, very close. Um, some compromises come from that, but it's not a big deal. Uh, so yes. Basically, just um, make focus, like put a focus on infinity, just uh, doubt. Yes, you could. Uh, and that's how a lot of like the DIY community worked for many years. Is that a question? Yeah. Can I show off an actual diopter in front of the actual camera? Yeah. All right, let's show off an act. Let's get a very strong one because then maybe Ellie can hold it and we can do something fun with it. Um, so let's uh, let's do a plus three. Oh, actually no, let's. I lie. Let's do a plus half. So the number tells me how far I can focus. Uh, plus half is going to be two meters away. Uh, it's always in metric because someone decided it was better. So if I put this in front of the lens, I put this in front of the lens, um, it's going to set that my infinity is now at two meters. Ellie seems to be less than two meters away, so I'm going to go towards infinity and try to find her. Oh, there she is. Right, sort of, but not quite. There she is, okay. So, um, what is something that happened in between those two things? How is the background? Um, you wanna do it, you wanna hold it? All right, there you go. This is a very cool shot. Um, uh, okay, so let's look at the background. Ellie, do you have enough hold that you can pull it off? Okay, take it away. Okay, so now we're going to focus back on Ellie. How are the background lights? Are the same size? Or are they slightly smaller now? This is a scientific, science experiment that I haven't done myself. <laughs> so, theoretically, they should be smaller, smaller now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, Ellie, let's put this back in. Yeah, right? Um, so using diopters is also a way to enhance the anamorphic look. Um, diopter, is that another question? Oh, I was gonna say. We didn't show the diopter at all. Uh, I, I Never mind. I was gonna say, uh... Cheaper lens, yes. We will show it on the cheaper lens. OK. We will go back to a cheaper lens. Yeah. This is a $10,000 lens. Uh, for reference. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so diopters and anamorphic have a very complicated relationship, or it's very intertwined. Anamorphics suck at close focus, so people have to use diopters. And then when you use diopters at close focus, you also get a nicer look, a more pronounced anamorphic look. Um, which is a win-win for everyone, except that you lose infinity. So a lot of people are like, ah, man, I want my lens to focus from infinity down to like one inch from camera, uh, but I can't do it. And I don't want to use a diopter because I'll lose infinity. Like, okay, uh, just, you got to decide what your shot is about. I doubt that you have a shot that you have to rack from infinity to an inch from camera. Like, you know, break it down, <laughs> make it work. Um, and it has to do with working with the limitations. So let's go for a cheaper lens. 
We're going to go for something cheaper. Um, this is a 40 mil. We're going to go to a 35. This is $1,000, $1,200. It's, we're going to rip off the adapter as well, so it can be oh. done here. Yeah, I can press right. it. Am I pressing the right button? I'm not. Yes, here we go. Okay. Thank you. Um, so this is gonna, this is a $1,200 lens, dollar lens, I think. And is this full frame? Yes. Um, Blake, this is 1.6. And... Okay. Do you think the other one is 10 times better? <laughs> it is better, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so we get flares. They're very saturated. Um, they are more saturated than the last one. They're also more pronounced. Uh, this is a 35 as opposed to the 40. And if you look at that C stand on that image, um, can you tell if it's bending? It's going like, whoop, yeah. right? That is very unusual for anamorphics. Like, cook anamorphics do this. Almost all other anamorphics, they bend outwards. Um, so a lot of people just like hate this for absolutely no reason, except that they're like, ah, whatever. Um, but OK, so here we are. We have our shot. It's not 10 times better, but it's, it's, it's something. And we're going to try a diopter. I don't have a plus half, so we're going to have to cheat a plus something else, plus one. This is a plus one? Of course not. Never get the right one. This is not a plus one. This is a plus one. Okay. Um, well, let's see. So now, this lens also does the thing where the image changes size. The squeeze changes as you rack through it. Can you see it? Extending to the sides and back. Yeah, so this is bad breathing because the breathing is happening a lot in the horizontal axis as well. Like because of the squeeze change, the breathing is changing wildly. Um, so the closer we are to infinity, the closer we are to the 1.6 squeeze that they advertise. And this means that, oh, oops, wrong ring. Yeah, Ellie, I'm going to have to have you lean forward a little bit. All right? Am I doing this right? Yeah. OK, so um, what do we feel about the bouquet on that one? Is it better? Did we gain a lot? I'm going to boost the ISO because it's kind of dark. The flares have changed, right? That's a very interesting aspect of it. Whoa, this fell in. Ooh. Oh, that's. Is that a bug or a feature? Um, bug, for sure. Um, this lens is one stop darker than the other. It's also way less squeeze. So bokeh is not nearly as magical, not nearly as pronounced. Not even with a diopter. Oh, yeah, big one. Thank you. Um, mm hmm Uh, yes, so most of the time, if you want to squeeze your bokeh, you would go for a squeezier stretch factor, like a, a two times is the traditional film squeeze. Uh, there are other techniques in optics and tricks and whatnot that will give you a squeezier bokeh without necessarily being a two times lens. They're not incredibly popular, so it's not a guarantee. Um, okay, what are we going to? Just, just because? Yeah, we could do that right now. Like we're we're gonna do that with this. It probably will look like trash, but we'll find out. So if we put this in front of here, let's see how big is this little glass. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna get a longer lens. Let's do um fifty, no, seventy-five. Seventy-five will probably survive. Let's swap. Whole thing comes off. 
Okay. And that adapter is pretty messed up, so we're gonna just... Did I turn off the camera? What did I do? Oh, no. There we go. Okay, so this is a 75. Yes, this will work. I think we are too close to get focus. Yeah, Blake, this is 1.33. Um, Ellie, you're gonna have to slide back a little bit. Almost there. Twice that. Yeah, sort of. You can see, like, this is way flarier. Flare's coming right at the corner. Really hurting our um, contrast. Okay, so this is 1.33. If we try to stack a two times on top of that, this would be 2.66. Squeeze. My camera can't do it, but maybe the computer can. It does weird stuff. Yeah, and what happens also with adapters that's fairly annoying that I said I was going to mention before is you can really mess up the angle of the alignment, um, which is not great fun. Um, yes, unless that's what you want. Uh, do you see the golden diagonal flare there? This is coming from the adapter. And the blue flare is from the lens itself because the coatings are different. They will line up. Yeah, there. So this is how you align an adapter. You get the flare to be horizontal. Yeah, you got eyeball. It's a pain. Yeah. You always get it wrong. If you're like <laughs> one degree off, you're like, oh, I can tell this is off. And like, oh, I couldn't tell while I was shooting it. Um, yeah. Uh, fun fact, this adapter was made by the company of the guy who invented Anamorphics. So this is a very old lens, but it's also a piece of trash. So, <laughs> uh, Yes, but not all history is good. Uh, okay, so this is a 75, very little squeeze. Uh, 1.33. Uh, look at that. I did some trickery that I forgot about. Um, if you look at the oval bouquet, that is very oval, very oval, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I wonder what's going on. Uh, what's going on is I open this lens, and I put a disc in here. So if you look through the lens, you're going to see that there's an oval in there. And if you want to use your phone as a flashlight, let me see if I find one, um, you will very clearly see that the oval is placed in there, and it's not the same type of oval that you would see like this. Ah, Ariana got it. You can see it from the front. <laughs> hmm? Oh, your phone died? <laughs> Sorry. I mean, if you use this light, you can probably see it. Yeah, you will see that there's an insert. Um, all your question. There's no function. Yeah, it's just, it's been established, and we're like, this is pretty, this is expensive, this is what I want. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, Lila, I'm trying to think. Yeah, it's like, oh, your bouquet, the bouquet, get ready. If you're, if you're filming with anamorphics and you get your adapter misaligned, someone will be like, the bouquet is kind of diagonal, man. <laughs> and like, okay. Uh, yes, probably the first, <laughs> if not the second. Uh, let's go with something else. Yes, yes, very good question. Um, yeah, it cuts light, so it's cutting about two stops of light. Um, and the ideal place to put it is at the aperture. So like I opened the lens, got to the aperture mechanism, measured it, laser cut some stuff, and put it in there. Uh, so yeah, I'm losing a ton of light by doing that. That versus a stronger squeeze, yeah, yeah. Was it DIY, like DIY yourself? Yeah, I live streamed while I did that. I messed up many times. Just like, oh, well, this is not good. Uh, yeah, lots of like stripped screws in this process, but okay. So different lens now. Uh, this is an eighty-five millimeters, and 
I don't know how good the minimum focus is on this guy. All right, here we go. Am I on full frame? Yes, I am. Beautiful. Okay. Um, I'm just going to stop it down for contrast. This is 1.8. Uh, looks very close to two times. The bokeh is very oval. Um, we have a very good separation that if we were using a spherical lens, um, what would happen is we wouldn't get all of that field of view horizontally. Like we would probably get, uh, I know exactly how much we would get, but not to the end of both stands um, and the same vertical field of view. So this gives us more, more area there. And this streak flare is very interesting. Um, this lens uses yet another focusing method. Uh, you can see it's not as big as the other one on the front. Um, and it doesn't change squeeze factor. So it's not using the, the basic synchronized focus mechanism. It's also not using the variable diopter thingy that we were talking about. Um, they have elements inside that are adjusting and compensating for all the moving parts. So you don't get a squeeze change, but you also get a smaller, lighter lens, uh, which is nice. Also expensive, $9,000. Yeah. Uh, this is a Vazen 85mm. I think it's about $9,000, maybe $8,000, which is still a lot. Um, <laughs> yes. I noticed on the left, mm -hmm. it was like squeeze, but suddenly the image there turns out to yeah. be normal. Like the yeah, so, so that's Blake doing his trickery. Uh, he's quickly switching between different squeeze factors depending on the lenses that we're using. So if I put like a spherical lens here, it's going to look super wide, and then he's going to click a button before we think, and it's going to look proper. Uh, but, but if here. you're filming the camera, the bar will be squeezed? Yeah, so if you're filming on the camera, this is what you're going to see. Um, oh. the fi your final file is going to look like this. but. A few cameras, I think Red, Alexa, Panasonic, some Black Magic, give you the option of adjusting the squeeze factor. So here I have 1.8, which is great. But the other lens that was 1.6, we couldn't do it. I could get to 1.5, but it's not quite right. Um, and this helps so much with preview. Because you're looking at it, you're like, OK, this is what the frame looks like on top of, of the frame itself. I have an overlay for uh, 2.4 to 1 aspect ratio, so I know what's going to be left out of the frame, and I don't frame something to be wider than I can actually deliver. So it's a combination of things. Uh, one thing that we kind of talked about was the, a lot of these lenses you can just rotate and put them the other way. So now, well, shit. I don't know how to do this. Blake, this is 1.8 in the opposite direction. Um, however, we get that. <laughs> yeah. Now you look really strange right now, but I promise it's not on purpose. Uh, <laughs> um, one thing that we can already see is the ovals are going horizontally, like we had predicted before. Um, which is good, I guess. But it also gives me an image that can only be achieved with a medium format sensor uh, for stills. Even for video, there's not a lot of options of cameras that will give you this big of a sensor area because we're using, oh my god, what are we using? 36 horizontally, and then 24 times 1.8, whatever that is, almost. 40 something. So it's, a, it's almost a square, 36 by 40 something millimeters. And it's huge. It's a huge image area to deal with. This one, yes. Yes? No, I lie. Here's, let's go for the full sensor. Uh, this is a full sensor readout. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so if your camera can do uh, more vertical area, like if 
if you're allowed to film 16 by 9 videos or if you use the 3 by 2 sensor, that is always preferred. Um, otherwise, the more squeeze factor you get, the more sensor area you're going to be wasting because you're going to be getting to a situation where uh, this looks pretty dope. Yeah. Hmm. But yeah, the bokeh is going the other way. Uh, let's put ourselves in a really bad spot here. And I'm going to get a two time squeeze lens. Hmm. Yes. Are you like. They are. They are, yes. Well, let's get this guy here. Well, well, so many weights. Wow. Get out of here. I got the worst light because this is the most finicky one. Um, but let's see if that happens. Do we have lens flares? Am I on the wrong side of the camera? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. so there we go. We have a vertical lens flare. Wow. This is very super 8, the movie. Also the square aspect ratio. Yeah. So yeah, vertical lens flares. OK. Back to here. The streak flares? Yeah, so another way of cheating lens flares is there are filters called streak flares. Uh, they just go in front of your lens, and there are a bunch of lines. And they will give you those flares at a cost. Uh, Lila, let's do the swap. Uh, I'm going to go for the Lomo, the 35 Lomo. Am I in the right spot? Sort of, sort of, yes. You got it? All right. Mm, yes. So back to the idea of the camera is limiting our. Yeah. yeah this is one of the tightest ones. Uh, I think we're sideways. Yeah, oh, yeah, we 35. are. Here we go. No. No, not yet. Oh, but this is a short, stubby one. So. You have it? Mm, I have the lens, yeah. Okay. Get in. Get in. OK. All right. OK. Back to the topic. Uh, let's say our camera can only do, did I kill something, Blake? OK. Uh, our camera can only do 16 by 9. So this is our full sensor readout. Um, and we're just losing a little bit on the sides, right? But if I go to a 16 by 9 format, this is going to be OK. I have a lot more area being wasted on the sides. Uh, it's hard to see here, but roughly from here to here, all is being like discarded. Uh, and that's not good. Like you're basically wasting production value at this point because you have a set and it's dressed and it's in the shot. But for your delivery format, you're going to have to get rid of it. So it's like, OK. Uh, so a lot of the game is figuring out your delivery aspect ratio, the camera that you're filming on, and what kind of squeeze you need to match those two things and waste the littlest amount of money in the process. Um, what else? What else is there? Questions, concerns, ideas. Any ideas? All sorts of ideas. Does someone have the time? 7.49. Is it 7.49? I'm going to go with yes. All right, let's go back to the other side. Uh, since no one had questions, uh, we're just going to wrap up with something I wanted to ask last time, and I didn't get to it. Um, like, I'm going to kill this camera, and it's going to not die? OK. That's my favorite part. The don't worry about it. OK. Um, I'm going to turn this off, steal this chair. Let's just drag it. OK. OK. Well, if it falls now, it lived long enough. Yeah, it can go on. 
It can go in the corner and it's gonna it's just gonna keep falling. <laughs> oh we can tilt this here. I'm just gonna remove it. Let's just take it off. Okay, oh. <laughs> Could not. <laughs> Things falling apart. Okay, let's go back to where's that thing. Okay, so focus, we talked about a focus. Um which brings us to conclusions. Um I guess the second part was still very spread out. Hopefully, you were entertained in some way. Um, this question is very specific, so I guess I'll ignore it. Um, I'm just going to go for the last question. That's it. Uh, <laughs> uh, walking out of here, if you were to take away one thing, and be like, OK, I learned this, and it was very cool, or I learned this, and it was very useful. Um, or, I don't know, what's your takeaway from this experience? <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, so excitement about seeing things in your hands and what you can do and creative approaches to it. All right. It's a good thing. I already feel like a winner. <laughs> OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are very. Uh, lots of it. Are very weird. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yes. Yes. There are very few anamorphic zooms. Um, they are very expensive and hard to make. Uh, it has to do with how the optics behave. Zooms are very limiting. So most anamorphic zooms are rear anamorphics, like that thing that we passed around. Uh, which is unfortunate, but there are a few. They're just less common. What happened? We have considered, and I think we kind of tried this once or twice, and it just gets out of hand. Uh, <laughs> we did not have the patience for it. Uh, it's also hard because you have to find a par focal zoom where you can like just rack the zoom range without having to adjust focus. Um, you could try it with adapters. There are a few adapters that work with zoom lenses, but oh, we didn't even get to that. Well, yeah, yeah, it's hard. <laughs> yes. Yeah. They are. Uh, a lot of them are. Uh, the ones that we saw were particularly flary, except the very first one. The very first one was very flare resistant. Because a lot of people into anamorphics, they want flare. So it's like, oh, let's crank this stuff up. But yeah, you can get flares from out of, source, out of frame sources. Yeah. Yeah, so that, yeah, that, okay, that has to do with the, the other question that I was like, oh, god damn it. Um, when you're using adapters, a lot of the time they will limit your field of view. Like when you mount the adapter onto a lens, if the lens, like you're mounting it to a 35 millimeters, oh, we saw that a little. Uh, we had a 35 mil, we put the adapter in front, it was just a little circle and everything black around it. Um, that is very common with adapters. So you've got to find a focal length that kind of like pushes through the size of the adapter. That's why I went with a 75. Um, and this also has to do with the matte box because a lot of times you put on a matte box and you're like, oh, wow, this lens is a little too wide for this and I can't use a matte box. Um, so yes, uh, you have to watch out for your horizontal field of view and how that is influenced. Yes. Remind me.
Ya. Ya. Yeah. So today, Colin prepared me for that question. He told me it was coming. He was like, you know, Dan is thinking about this. I'm like, ah, yes. Um, and also, we've had a lot more options since last time I was here. Um, Atlas, who makes that 40 mil, the, like the thick 40 millimeters that we looked at, they just announced a new series of lenses called Mercury. And they are full frame lenses. They're 1.5 times squeeze. So it'd be like, ah, less oval. But they used all of the optical trickery to get more oval bouquet. Uh, they are good for cinema cameras. And they are, I think, uh, $6,000 on the pre-order. That is not terrible for the level of quality that Atlas as a company uh, strives for. I would say it's a, probably the best bet to budget and look at the moment. Yeah. Funny enough, there is a moment lens, and that is not what I would recommend at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No. <laughs> uh, you got to get specific. Like, I've, I've experimented with like probably 30 or 40 adapters at this point, maybe more. Uh, there's only one that I kept, and it's called the Iskurama. It's, kind, it's a single focus adapter. It works from 50 millimeters ish on, on full frame, and it has a 1.5 times squeeze. Uh, that was the best adapter I could find uh, with, and I was like, I'm happy with this. It gives me a good squeeze. It's small. It's light. It's good for an adapter. Um, if you want to try it out, just send me a message. <laughs> it's not here today. Um, yeah, and if you want to try any of these things, you're like, oh, I have a project. I want to use this uh, lens or that lens that we saw here, or I just want to figure out what's available, send me an email. Uh, I'll ask these guys to send a follow-up email to everyone that's here so you have my contact and I just want people using this all of the time. <laughs> yeah. I keep changing it but out of all of the ones we saw today my favorite's probably like the 40 mil the thick one. Uh, my disliking of it is very heavy. Heavy I'm weak. I'm like all right let's go. <laughs> I'm done for today. Let's go. Let's go home. Um, but it's the one that delivers the best look. Um, I think it gives me like the most natural field of view. It's the lens that I'm always like reaching for. It's like, oh, this is what I want to see. And the close-ups feel close-up-y enough, and the wide shots feel wide enough that I don't have the need for multiple focal lengths. Uh, but yeah, it's heavy and it's expensive. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Yeah, uh, one, no, three of those lenses. Uh, the lenses on the camera right now is from the 70s, still here. Worth way more now than it was before. Um, anything that's currently in production, you're likely to see a little loss of value. Um, with these new ones, they're going to come out, and they're probably going to be short on supply for usually two years, three years. So if you buy it at $6,000 and you sell it within that time, you can probably charge more than what you paid for because you have it ready to go. Um, but after a while, they're going like, to top their value. They're not going to get cheap. You're not going to be able to buy it. Oh, yeah, I'm just going to give you 200 bucks for this lens. That's not going to happen. Uh, even the anamorphics that we see, like the cheaper ones that are sub $1,000, in the two, two and a half years that they've been out, I've seen a drop of value of maybe $200, which is 20% of the original price. So it's not a lot of drop. 
uh, and there's still a lot of people buying them. So it's good that we have more options. They're all pretty different from each other. Uh, so it's kind of investigating which one you like best and why and leaning into it instead of, oh, I like this part of these lenses, but I want this flare, but I also want the compression from this other one, because then you're going to be unhappy the entire time. <laughs> That's not me. <laughs> yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah, 20 mil is spherical. Yeah, and it does not cover full frame. So um, that is a deal breaker for some people. It was not for me. It's like Super 35 is large enough for what I want to do. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's kind of it. Like, those ones are rehoused, like somebody got the glass from old Soviet lenses and put them in new mechanics, and here they are still kicking. Um, so yeah, there's a lot, there's more options now of like people rehousing and harvesting glass from old mechanics and putting into more modern systems that are more reliable, faster, lighter. Yeah, not cheaper, <laughs> never cheaper. <laughs> yeah. So this is my last slide. Thank you. <laughs> subscribe, like, and subscribe. Thank you. Yeah. If you have any questions, email me. Uh, message, Telegram, WhatsApp, <laughs> smoke signals. No, so yeah, yeah. I'm 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 not really on Instagram. Uh, if you want to email me, that's a guaranteed response. If you want to email me and say, "Hey, I was at the workshop," that's a two hundred percent guaranteed response. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we did it. Thank you, thank you guys for being here. This is great. This is fun. I feel like I talk a lot. <sighs> yes. Oh yeah, I'm gonna.